So the subject assigned to me is the case for total sanity. The case for total sanity. That is, uh, why should we use only the 150 psalms in the biblical psalter and nothing else in the singing of praise to God? Can I say straight away that I appreciate this opportunity uh, that Pastor Barr has given me and the free hand that he has given me to fully argue the case. Let me say at the outset, and I'll say it only this once, in the interest of time, that my aim is not to insult those who have yet to embrace this position, uh, nor to deny the godliness of some who have uh, not only differed in their views, but written hymns in the past. Uh, That is not my aim, and yet I have to say that I do want to argue for the position that I believe to be according to the word of God, fully, clearly, and uh, of necessity, bluntly. And so, if those of you who are attached to uninspired hymns of one sort or another, I say that at the outset, that my aim is not uh, to, uh, to insult, but at the same time, I do want to plainly, uh, as plainly as possible, set before you what I believe to be the biblical teaching on this important subject. And in doing so, I want to address 11 questions. 11 questions. They are vastly unequal in length, but 11 questions nonetheless. First of all, does it matter how we worship God? Mr. Watts uh, covered much of this earlier on today, but does it matter how we should worship, how we worship God? It ought to matter. If it doesn't matter, our view of God is too low. If in your mind it doesn't matter how we worship God, then your view of God is not biblical. If God is the glorious, majestic, awesome, holy being that the scriptures uh, set him forth to be, then it must matter. And if our thought of God is not of this awesome being that the Bible makes known to us, then all that we have to say from now on will seem like much ado about nothing. So if you have a low view of God, then inevitably you will think that anything goes as far as his worship is concerned. But if we have a biblical view of God, of his greatness and majesty and glory and dominion and power, then we will consider it to be of the utmost importance how we worship this great God. Secondly, but isn't it the attitude of heart that matters? Isn't it the attitude of heart that matters? There are sincere people who on hearing of a subject like this would feel that this is really uh, making a mountain out of a molehill because what matters above all else is the attitude of heart. Now the right attitude of heart is vital. Uh, when uh, men draw near to God with their lips and their hearts are far from him, it is an abomination to God. But the two things are not opposites. Inner attitude and outward form. In fact, they go together. If our hearts are right, will it not show itself in a desire to ensure that the outward form of our worship glorifies and pleases God? In other words, we should seek to be biblical from the inside out. From the inside out, we should seek to conform to the word of God. Our heart attitude must be right, and the heart attitude must express itself in a desire to submit absolutely to the word of God on the form of our worship. But then thirdly, we ask the question, how, who decides how to worship God? Who decides how to worship God? And the simple answer is, God does. God 
decides how God is to be worshipped. We must acknowledge God as God at the threshold of our worship. Before we do anything, we must acknowledge that God is God and that because He is God and we are dependent creatures, not to mention dependent sinners, that therefore we must not invent our own ideas of what is acceptable and what we consider should be acceptable to Him. We must express our dependence and submission to God at the beginning of our worship. We are not to assume that He should accept whatever we like to offer. And only then, when we have usurped His kingly authority in deciding what shall be done in His worship, then we begin to acknowledge that He's God after all. God knows best what God is like, and God tells us how we think of Him, and God tells us what ordinances He will use by the Spirit to direct us into right thoughts of Him. And so the question arises then, on what principle does the law require us to operate? If we are to listen to him as to how we should worship, then on what principle does he tell us to operate? Does he tell us in his word that we are to exclude only what he condemns in worship? Or does he rather say that we are to exclude all that he has not appointed in his worship? In other words, what do we do with those possible actions in worship, or parts of worship, or elements of worship, that are neither commanded nor condemned? Do we regard them as legitimately in or out? of the, 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 the range of options in the worship of God. And uh, as we have heard already today, uh, the answer is that the scriptures require us uh, to exclude from worship all that is not commanded, not only what is condemned, but all that is not commanded in worship. Reference has been made to Exodus 25, verse 40, where the Lord tells Moses, See that thou do all things according to the pattern showed thee on the mount. In Exodus 20, 25, uh, the Lord warns Israel about uh, creativity in worship. It's not creativity we need, it's submission. Exodus 20 and verse 25 if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone, for if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. And uh, of course, one of the classic texts on what we call uh, the regulative principle, Deuteronomy uh, chapter 12, verse 32, What things soever I command you, observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. And uh, the Old Testament contains uh, many examples of those who have violated this principle. Leviticus 10, 1 to 3, Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire unto the Lord. 1 Samuel 13, 8 to 14, Saul, uh, becoming impatient, didn't wait and offered sacrifice on his own initiative. Uh, the case of user and uh, uh, his touching the art of God. You'll find uh, the sequel in First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles chapter 15 and uh, verse 11. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests and for the Levites, for Uriel, Isaiah, and Joel, Shemaiah, and Eliel, and Aminadab, and said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites, sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because ye did not at the, did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us 
for that we sought him not after the due order. And so the Lord required that his worship and all the handling of that ark which was part of that ceremonial worship appointed in at that time uh, the, the principle thou shalt not add thereto nor diminish therefrom should apply. And so we have uh, the other cases of rebellion where kings took upon priestly will, upon them priestly rules, where Moses uh, struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And the Lord rebukes Israel in Jeremiah 7.31 for their uh, sacrificing of their children. He says, which I commanded thee not, I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. Neither came it into my heart. I didn't require this. I never required it at your hands. And of course in the, the New Testament the same principle applies. God has not changed. Uh, the form of worship changed in various ways but the principle did not. And so Matthew 15 verse 9 the Pharisees are rebuked but in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And in Matthew 28 as we heard earlier on the Lord Jesus Christ tells his uh, disciples, his apostles, that they are uh, to go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That means the elders of the church should be able to show the scriptural basis for every action of worship that they call upon the congregation of the Lord to engage in. If they do not have that authority, then they are acting as usurpers over the flock of God. In Colossians 2.23, the apostle condemns will worship, and by will worship he means forms of worship which have their origin in what man wants rather than what God commands. To seek to worship God by our own inventions is to usurp his prerogative. And it is to risk creating our own idea of what God should be like. What could be more calculated to lead us to wrong views of God than for us to invent the ordinances of worship by which we worship God? That's why John Knox said, All worshipping, honouring or service invented by the brain of man in the religion of God without his own express commandment is idolatry. Because it's the creature determining how he shall worship the creator. It is the creature saying what he thinks God should be like instead of the creator telling the creature how he should think of him. We must know our place, dependent creatures and sinners with deceitful hearts. Human invention must be rejected and only divine ordinances are to be engaged in. God is to be worshipped, not your way, not my way, but God's way. No other, no other. We cannot come to a gentleman's agreement and say, well, it's a lot okay for you, doesn't really suit me, but that's okay. That's the way of the world, but uh, whatever makes you feel right is okay. It's not. The only way to worship God is God's way, to the exclusion of all others. Fourthly then, does the Bible say that we should sing psalms? Well, yes, it does. Psalm singing was appointed in the Old Testament and uh, it simply is not abrogated in the New. Sing ye to him, sing psalms to him. And uh, many passages in the Psalms and elsewhere tell us to sing psalms in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, uh, we are, there are references to psalmody in 1 Corinthians 14, 26 
Uh, in James 5.13, is any merry, let him sing psalms. And in Ephesians 5.19, speaking to yourselves and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, teaching and admonishing your, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Whatever else these verses mean, they must mean, uh, they must at the very least include the idea of singing psalms. So the exclusion of psalm singing from worship is inexcusable. There is no excuse for any church excluding God-given psalms in favor of human compositions. Every church should and must sing psalms. And if we would want to say sing anything other than psalms, the burden of proof is with those who want to sing something else. You see, people have the idea, and I'm sure we've all had the idea at times, that those who argue for exclusive psalmody must prove exclusive psalmody. That's not so. That we should sing psalms is clear. If you want to sing something else, you must prove. You must prove that something else has the warrant of the word of God. The burden of proof is not with the exclusive psalm singer, it's with those who want to sing something other than those psalms which are clearly appointed by God. So if you want to sing Watts and Wesley and Top Lady, you've got to prove from the word of God that you have a warrant for doing so. The burden of proof is with the anti-exclusive psalm singer, not the other way around. To worship God in spirit and in truth, we must worship according uh, to scriptural command. We must worship in a biblical way. And we must not only worship in a biblical way, but we must know that it is a biblical way. We must know, we must be sure, if our conscience is dogged by uncertainty as to whether the act of worship we are engaging in is according to the word of God or not, how can we worship in spirit and in truth? We must know, we must be sure, it is clear the psalms should be sung in worship. That is beyond doubt. And therefore we can worship in spirit and in truth in the singing of the psalms. But then, what fifth question? What about hymns and spiritual songs? And here we get to the nub of the whole thing, I suppose. What about hymns and spiritual songs? We'll concentrate uh, on Ephesians 5.19 uh, for the purpose of this particular study. In Ephesians 5.19 we read that we, that we are to be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now for many at the first reading, that's an end of the matter. It says psalms, but it also says hymns and spiritual songs. Surely it is said, there you have it. We can sing psalms, but we can sing other things as well. But we must not assume that these words mean what we use them to mean today. The fact that we use the word hymns of compositions by men like Top Lady or Watts does not mean that that is what the apostle, the inspired apostle, had in mind. So the question is not how are these terms used today, but how were they used by the apostle Paul under the direction of the Spirit of God when he wrote these words. So let's look First of all, at the meaning of the words. The meaning of the words. In the New Testament, the word hymn, or the verb to hymn, occurs occasionally, most notably in Matthew 26, verse 30, at the Last Supper, when we read that Christ and his disciples sang a hymn, or literally, that they hymned. And it is virtually universally conceded, even 
by those who do not accept exclusive psalmody, that this refers to the practice at the Passover of singing the great Hallel Psalms, Psalm 114 to 118. So, hymning is here used as a description of singing psalms. Now, in the Old Testament, three Hebrew words are commonly used of the psalms. Uh, three words, Mizmor, Tehillah, and Shir. And they are roughly, uh, though not uniformly, rendered in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, known as the Septuagint, by the Greek words Psalmos, Psalm, Hymnos, Hymn, and Ode, Psalm. So these three words, these three Hebrew words, when the uh, Old Testament was translated into Greek, it was the word psalm, hymn, and song that are used in the place of these three Hebrew words, each in various places used as a description of what we call the Book of Psalms. Now this Greek translation, known as the Septuagint, was in constant use in the Greek-speaking synagogues. And uh, so uh, Greek-speaking Jews going to Greek-speaking synagogues would hear this Greek translation of the Old Testament read in their synagogues. And this Greek translation, where adequate, is quoted from by the apostles. It's quoted from in the New Testament. Now, let us look then at some of the uses of these three terms in uh, the Greek version of the Old Testament to which, uh, or from which, the apostles frequently quote. First of all, in the titles of the Psalms. The word Psalmos, Psalm, is used in 67 of the titles, and that's clear in our English Bibles, the word Psalm appears in uh, the titles. The word Psalm is used in 35 of the titles of the Psalm. Now the word Hymn is less obvious in our English Bibles, but it is used in the title six times as a translation of the phrase in our English Bibles, On Neginoth. There is one exception to that, uh, but six times out of the seven where On Neginoth appears in the title of a psalm, in the Greek translation it is Humnos Hymn that is used. Interestingly, twelve titles of the Psalms have psalm and song. Two of them have psalm and hymn. Psalm 76 has psalm, hymn, and song. So the Greek Old Testament describes Psalm 76 as a psalm and a hymn and a song. All three. That's the use of the title, the, the words in the titles of the Psalms. But then in the text of the Psalms. And this also is interesting. In the text of the Psalms, these words are also used. Psalm 65 uh, has in the title a psalm and a song. But the first verse of the psalm, praise waits for thee in Zion, that word praise, tehillah, is translated in the Greek with him. So this psalm and song begins in its first verse with, to transliterate, to thee, O Lord, in Zion, a hymn is befitting. So there you see the title and the first verse of that psalm have all three terms in them. In them. Or Psalm 100, verse 4, again, transliterating from the Greek, enter into his gates with hymns. The word praise is rendered hymns. Psalm 137, verse 3, if again we give a, a, a rough, literal rendering of what the Greek version has, it would be as follows. There those that led us captive demanded of us words of a song, and those that carried us away demanded of us a hymn, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And then a verse that 
was referred to last night in a different context as Psalm 22 and verse 22 Psalm 22 and verse 22 I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee now in Hebrews 2 verse 12 where this is quoted it is the Greek Septuagint what's called the Greek Septuagint translation that is quoted in the scriptures of the New Testament themselves so Hebrews 2 12 I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee that phrase I will sing praise is one Greek word which means I will him unto thee now in its original setting it's David the Lord's anointed in the midst of the church of Israel granted there was typical meaning of Christ and the whole church of God but in its original setting it was referring to David the sweet psalmist of Israel praising the Lord in the midst of the congregation of Israel and it is, de it is described as hymning as hymning to God so there we have the use of the title of, of these words in the titles of the psalms and in the text of the psalms but then thirdly we have them as a description of the psalms Psalm 72 verse 20 the prayers of David the son of Jesse are ended in the Greek rendering it is the hymns of David the son of Jesse are ended so that David's psalms are as a whole are described as the hymns of David or in 2 Chronicles, 20, 2 Chronicles 29 verse 30 they sang hymns in, uh, sang hymns to the Lord in the words of David and Asa the seer the hymns to the Lord in the words of David and Asa the seer so the words of David and Asa in our Psalter are described as hymns now one particularly interesting case is in Psalm 105 Psalm 105 and verse 2 Psalm 105 verse 2 sing unto him sing psalms unto him talk ye of all his wondrous works now Psalm 105 is also found in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 9 or 16 1 Chronicles 16 and verse 2 of Psalm 105 is also found in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 9 so if you look at verse 9 of 1 Chronicles 16 and verse 2 of Psalm 105 the English is the same the Hebrew is the same but when translated into Greek in 1 Chronicles it was rendered sing hymns to him and in Psalm 105 it was rendered sing psalms to him because the terms were used somewhat interchangeably and both describe the compositions of the inspired psalmist of Israel and so taking all of this together there is no reason whatever to look for a meaning of the apostles' words, psalms, hymns, and songs beyond the biblical book of psalms, hymns, and songs. But then, having looked at the words, let's look at the number of the words. Perhaps you feel, well, yes, but why would the apostle use three words to describe the book of psalms? Well, the scriptures often use a multiplicity of terms and sometimes together to describe the same things for example God's laws are called his ordinances his statutes and his judgments as well as his commandments we read of miracles and signs and wonders we read of prayers, supplications and intercessions a multiplying of terms to describe the same thing so why should we have difficulty with the idea of the apostle using psalms and hymns and songs to describe the biblical book of psalms 
And then, the third thing we need to consider is the non-exclusiveness of each word. The non-exclusiveness of each word. What do I mean? Well, I mean this. That one composition can be a psalm and a hymn and a song all at once. That's true from the titles. Psalm 76, we know it had all three in them. It's, no, it's, it's obvious from the descriptions, the fact that hymns are used of the psalms and songs of degrees. Uh, for example, in Psalm 72, verse 20, the hymns of David. Or in Psalm 65, the title has psalm and song, and the text, the first verse, has hymn. So it's quite clear that one composition can be a psalm and a hymn and a song. So that any, any definition of these terms cannot be mutually exclusive. If you define a psalm one way and a hymn another way and a song another way, those definitions must allow for the fact that one composition can be all three at the same time. That's confirmed by the fact that in Ephesians 5.19, uh, when it says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, praising and making melody in your heart to the Lord, that word, that phrase, making melody, the Greek is the verb salo. So that we would have, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, psalming unto the Lord. So the singing of psalms, hymns, and songs, the singing of all three, is characterized as psalming unto the Lord. So it is quite clear that psalming and hymning and singing songs uh, can describe singing the same things. Then fourthly we must come to the word spiritual. Now the word order is psalms, hymns and songs spiritual. Psalms and hymns and songs spiritual. That's the word order in the Greek text. So the word spiritual could refer to all three. So that instead of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, it could be spiritual psalms, spiritual hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, for example, in Ephesians 3, 5, uh, his holy apostles and prophets. Does the word holy simply describe the apostles? Or does it describe the apostles and prophets? Uh, you see, even in English, we can talk about a group of children. They were good boys and girls. Now, the phrase written down, good boys and girls, does that mean they were good boys and they were girls as well? Or does it mean they were good boys and good girls? A lot depends, of course, on how you see it. They were good boys and girls. They were good boys and girls. In other words, the adjective could describe only one thing, or it could describe both. So it is here that the word spiritual uh, may have reference to all three terms. But then also we have to say that the word spiritual here is beyond doubt used in the sense of, of the Holy Spirit. You see, the setting is, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, pneuma, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and songs, spiritual pneumaticus. So the Greek is the same as in English, just as spirit and spiritual, the first part is the same, so in the Greek, pneuma is spirit, pneumaticus is spiritual. And there is no reason whatever to think that the word spiritual here means anything other than of the Holy Spirit. That instead of being under the influence of alcohol, they were to be under the influence of the Spirit, singing his psalms, hymns, and songs. And this is the normal usage of the word spiritual in the New Testament. 
uh, in evangelical circles, we are inclined to use the word spiritual in a rather vague sense of uh, those things which have to do with the spirit, with the souls of men. But that is not the normal biblical usage. The normal biblical usage is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And so the contrast between flesh and spirit, for example, is not between physical and spiritual. It's not between physical and non-material. It's not between the body and the soul. The normal usage of the word flesh is as a description of man in his fallen condition without the renewing grace of God. And so the word flesh is used of the physical side of man in his weakness and frailty on account of the fall. But more often it's used of his fallen nature, his heart uh, of sin and rebellion against God. And so the flesh is man apart from saving grace and that which is of the Spirit refers to the saving grace of God by the Holy Spirit uh, renewing and changing and working in the heart of sinners. And so the word spiritual then is to be understood in the sense of of the Holy Spirit and we get a, a good idea of what that means if you look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Here we are being told that what is written in Psalm 95 are the words of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost says, the Holy Spirit says. Now that can be said of the Psalms. It cannot be said of any extra biblical composition, even of the best of men. The, the Psalms of God are spiritual in the highest possible sense, breathed out by the Spirit of God. To sum up then, it is acknowledged that Psalms in our text refers to the inspired Psalter. We have seen that all three terms are used of the Psalter and in the Psalter in the, both the titles and texts, the text of the Psalms. The Psalms, and more likely all three, are described as of the Holy Spirit. The terms must not be interpreted in an ex a way that is exclusive of each other. And in Colossians 3.16, these terms are used uh, 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 describing a means whereby the word of Christ will dwell in us richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Now then, has anyone produced a definition of psalms and hymns and songs that is compatible with all of these facts? Has anyone produced a definition, for example, of psalms, hymns and songs which allows for the fact that the songs at least are said to be of the Spirit, the psalms are the psalms of Scripture, and which allows for the fact that one composition can be a psalm and hymn and song all at the same time, and having produced that definition, has anyone ever demonstrated that that definition is what the Apostle Paul had in mind? I don't believe it has ever been done. It has never been done as far as I know. People have guessed at what these terms may mean. They have took a shot in the dark, but they have never demonstrated from the text that their meaning is the meaning that the Apostle Paul had in his mind under the direction of the Spirit. And I don't believe that it will ever be proved either. Sixthly, may we not sing the other parts of Scripture? 
May we not sing the other parts of scripture? This comes uh, as an objection sometimes. Of course it has no bearing on the question of uninspired compositions. But the answer is still no. Not all of scripture was given for singing. The Psalms were. Romans was not. Proverbs was not. We sing what God has given for singing. It's as simple as that. We do as we're told. But then seventhly, what about the other songs in Scripture? What about the other songs in Scripture? We all know that there are songs elsewhere in Scripture, outside of the book of Psalms. And uh, sometimes the thought is offered, what about these? These are inspired songs, should they not be sung? Notice that this has no bearing whatever on the question of uninspired hymns. It wouldn't make Watson, Wesley and Top Lady any more justifiable from Scripture, even if this point were conceded. But before conceding that point, we must bear in mind some, of, some further facts. First of all, some of those songs outside the Psalter are also in the Psalter. Some of the songs outside the Psalter are also in the Psalter. 1 Chronicles 16, 7-36 is uh, the same as Psalm 105, 1 to 15, Psalm 96, 1 to 15, and Psalm 106, 47 to 48. So the song in, or the Psalm in 2 Samuel 22, 1 to 51, is also found in Psalm 18, verse 2 to verse 50. So some of the songs elsewhere in the Scriptures are in the Psalter as well. Then, secondly, elements of others of these songs are found scattered in the Psalms. The most obvious of these is the Song of Moses. You will find fragments of the Song of Moses in Psalm 71, verse 19, Psalms. To a lesser extent, that is true of the Song of Deborah in Judges 5. There are elements in Psalm 68, and also the Song in Habakkuk 3. Uh, there are elements uh, that, are, uh, that are duplicated in Psalm 18 and Psalm 68. So then, of these other songs in the Scriptures, some are included as a whole in the Psalter as well. Some are partially included in different places in the Psalter, and some are not. So that the indications are that the Psalter, the 150 Psalms collected together in God's providence in our Bibles as the book of Psalms, is the providentially collected manual of praise that we know is intended for the continuing use of the church in all generations. We cannot be sure about those psalms that are outside the Psalter and not included in it. The indications are that the book of Psalms is meant to be the permanent hymn book of the church, that in God's providence it was gathered together as a book of psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit to be used by all generations of the church since they were written. Of others it cannot be said that we are sure, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So then, there is no reason to think that the Apostle had in mind anything other than the book of Psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. Eighthly, why not uninspired hymns when we are not confined to the words of inspiration in praying and preaching? I'll repeat that one. Why not use uninspired hymns when we are not confined to the words of inspiration in praying and in preaching. 
And this is perhaps one of the commonest objections to exclusive psalmody. You say we've only got to sing the inspired psalms and not uninspired compositions, and yet when you're preaching, you're not confined uh, to only biblical uh, words. When you pray, you're not confined to biblical prayers. Our prayers should be biblical. Of course, they should, they should be molded by the scripture and we should use scripture in prayer. But we are not confined uh, to simply lifting the prayers recorded in scripture and using them as our own prayers. And so the argument is, why this restriction on what we sing when there is not the same restriction on what is preached and on our prayers. But this rests on a misunderstanding of the exclusive psalmody argument. It rests on the idea that exclusive psalm singers are saying only inspired materials in all parts of worship. But we're not. That is not our contention. But what we do see is this that there is a correspondence between divine appointment and divine provision. That there is a correspondence between divine appointment and divine provision. I suppose abstractly we could break up the worship of God, its ordinary parts, into reading, preaching, praying, sacraments, singing. But when we ask what is to be read, the answer is, the scriptures are to be read. When we ask, how are, how are men to preach? The answer is that the Lord in his word has told us that he will engage and call men to preach. There is a gift corresponding to the act. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, teachers are mentioned, and the Ephesians 4, 11, pastors and teachers. When it comes to prayer, we are promised the enabling of the Spirit in prayer in order to bring before God needs which vary from one place and one generation and one time to another. So in Romans 8, 26, 27, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. We know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit may give intercession according to the will of God. When we come to the sacraments, there is God's appointment of two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, to which there is to be no addition or subtraction. And when it comes to singing, the divine appointment and the divine provision is not a gift of uninspired hymn singing continuing and promised to the church. It is the Psalter. The scriptures do not tell us that the ascended Christ has promised a spiritual gift continuing after the apostolic age of hymn composition. Because the divine provision for that part of worship is not a continuing spiritual gift, but an infallible book of praise. Because God does not change, so we don't need this constant, uh, endless change of productions of hymn books, one after the other. It's endless. God doesn't change, and so his hymn book doesn't change, because it's given by him. But you see the correspondence between God's appointment and God's provision, that either God gives the materials for an act of worship, or he promises a gift for that act of worship. And whilst he has promised 
or the enabling of the Spirit in prayer and in preaching and the gift of preaching to be bestowed upon certain men in the church, his provision for what is read is the Scriptures, his provision for what is sung is not a gift, but a book of praise that does not change. Ninthly, aren't the Psalms inadequate? Aren't the Psalms inadequate? Now the, the answer to this, I hope I won't seem rude, but I think it needs to be said quite frankly, uh, that no, the Psalms are not inadequate, but we perhaps are. If you find the Psalms a problem, the problem is not in the Psalms, the problem is in you. And you need to seek grace to bring your heart into line with those songs that the Spirit of God puts into our very mouths to direct us to think right thoughts of God. Uninspired hymns tell us what men think about God, but in the Psalms God tells us what we should think about God. And another consideration is this, or another sub-objection, we'll not call it another, a separate point. But what about the references in the Psalms to sacrifice, to incense, to Levitical choirs and orchestra? These things are abrogated. And you say, you're saying we've got to sing about these things. But you see, the practice of these things is abrogated. But the truth set forth in these things most certainly is not abrogated. Yes, we do not offer sacrifices. We do not have a Levitical uh, choir and orchestra. We do not use incense. But all of these things have meaning. And that meaning stands. And the New Testament bears that out. The sacrifice of praise continually. Or the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, takes up the symbolism. As Revelation was reaching its completion, it takes up the ceremonial symbolism of that which was actually practiced in the Old Testament as a way of describing elements of New Testament worship. So it talks about the incense, which is the prayers of saints. It talks about harping with harps, which signifies the praises of the people of God in ceremonial Old Testament abrogated language. And so to say that in singing the Psalms we're singing, about, we're singing about activities which no longer take place is irrelevant. We're singing about truth which is relevant now. In Hebrews 1 and 2 alone we find the Christ-centeredness of the Psalms. If we think the Psalms are inadequate. We are out of tune with the Word of God. We're, we're out of tune with, with, with the, the New Testament. Hebrews 1 tells us that God, who in Sunday times and in divers manners spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has spoken in these last days by His Son. And then in the first two chapters of Hebrews, to establish the supremacy of of the psalm compared with angels, we have quotations from Psalm 2, Psalm 104, Psalm 45, Psalm 102, Psalm 110, and Psalm 22. If you don't think the psalms are Christ-centered, it's because you don't know the psalms. But no, if there is a problem between us and the psalms, the problem is with us, not the Psalms.
It's because we don't understand them. And you know, I say to you, and I say this sincerely, and I hope that you don't feel that this is unkind, but I, I, I say this genuinely. Stop wasting your time. Stop wasting your time with debates and discussions about Victorian hymns over against mission plays. Get rid of them and redeem the time and get stuck into the Psalms of God because these are breathed out by God and the Psalms of God are the words of God and these are words and songs that you can live with and die with. The Psalms are worth spending time to understand because they're from God. The reformers, the Puritans, the Covenanters knew the Psalter. Many of them could have sung the whole psalm book. And they sang those psalms in their affliction. They didn't find them inadequate at all. Because they were engaged in the real battles of the Lord and they found them exceedingly relevant. And they sang them and they sang them when they went to the gallows and they sang them when they went to the stake. Inadequate. Who are we kidding? It's us that's wrong. And that brings us tenthly. But shouldn't people with poetic gifts be allowed to use them for the church's worship? Shouldn't people with poetic gifts be allowed to use them for the church's wish worship? There are people with poetic gifts, natural poetic gifts, but from God. Because whether men acknowledge it or not, every ability they have comes about in the providence of God. And so the argument is, if people have these gifts, they've a flair for poetry, for beauty of expression, and so on, shouldn't that poetic gift come to expression in the worship of God? The short answer is no. There's something we need to really address here. We all know Rome's view that for a thing to be Christian it must be under the church's jurisdiction that's because the man of sin the Roman Antichrist claims to be the vicar of Christ and of course in order for anything to be in submission to Christ it has to be in submission to the vicar of Christ in Rome that's the Roman blasphemy so that for something to be Christian it must be under the uh, jurisprudence, under the supervision, under the auspices of the papacy. So a Christian school is a church school. A Christian state is a church-controlled state. A Christian hospital is a church-controlled hospital. Because Christ-controlled and church-controlled in Romanism are one and the same. Because the Pope is the vicar of Christ, so-called. And so it is with what we might call culture and gifts art, sculpture, music must be brought under the province of the organized church to make it Christian that's the Romish view and of course you're all familiar with that and we all know how much of the great artwork and so on of the past and the musical compositions and sculpture has been done under the auspices of the Pope of Rome. Because in Romanism, Christian to be for something to be Christian and for it to be church controlled is one and the same. We reject that, of course we do. But in evangelicalism today, there is a bizarre tendency to argue in a somewhat similar fashion. The argument goes like this. You see, I have this gift. I'm pretty good at this and that and the other. Therefore, since this gift is from God, even though it's not mentioned in the scriptures as a gift given for the worship of God, because I have this gift from God, it's up to you, the church, 
to accommodate my exercise of that gift in the worship of God. And so, if Jimmy is good on the flute and Bob's not bad on the violin and Sally plays the guitar, well, we must somehow incorporate it all in the worship of God. And of course, Jenny's a bit of a choreographer, so we'll have to have the dancing as well. And then, well, these fellows over here, they're theatrically inclined, so we have the drama and the miming as well. It's only a matter of time before the art of the sculpture come in too. After all, if every God-given gift, real or imaginary, has to find expression in the worship of the church, there really are no limits, no boundaries. This is entirely wrong. We do not work from gift onwards but from the king downwards that's where we start not I have these gifts therefore the church must make a place for them rather it's Christ's church and he's the king of it what does he say must happen that's all that matters But then finally, eleventhly, isn't this view divisive? Isn't this view divisive? Sometimes because psalm singing has become a somewhat minority pursuit uh, or minority practice in evangelicalism and exclusive psalmody even more so, it is regarded as a divisive matter to assert this position. But that's looking at it entirely in the wrong way. We have 150 psalms that don't have any author's name at the end of them, whether it's uh, Augustus Toplady or John Henry Newman. Yes, he gets into a lot of the hymn books too. We have 150 compositions and every single one of them is infallibly breathed out by God. No Christian anywhere in the world or in any generation should have conscientious difficulty with singing any one of them. Now then, who is being divisive? Who? Those who say, he has 150 psalms, infallibly breathed out by God, and we should sing them, and just them. And we can all sing them. Because they're infallible, they'll not mislead us, if, we, if by the Spirit we understand them aright, we will never be deceived with wrong ideas or views of God. Let's stick to them. But over here says, there's someone who says, no, no, let's not stick to them. Let's, let's write a few other things and uh, put them in the place of using some of them. Who's divisive? It's not the psalm singer. It's not the man who sings only the psalms. Any of his brethren and sisters in the Lord could sing them with him. It's this, these those who want to bring in alongside the psalms of God compositions by some Tom, Dick or Harry. To introduce compositions of individuals, even godly individuals, in place of the God-given Psalter is sectarian divisiveness. And that's why the wrangle 
about which hymn books should and should not be used will not end because it is based on a sectarian practice. It is based on individualism and it is not compatible with the unity of the Church of God. Can I then close with a plea? A plea to stick to the God-given book of praise which he has given for the whole of his church. Let us worship God with the God-appointed heart attitude through the God-appointed mediator Jesus Christ and by way of the God-appointed outward ordinances of worship, including the God-given book of praise which he has given to the whole of his church for the people of God in all places and all in all generations. That is the recipe for greater unity amongst the people of God. Let us then rejoice that God has not left us to ourselves. He has not left us to wade through the mountains of man-made poetry that claim to be adequate for the praise of God. He has given us an inspired book of 150 psalms, hymns, and songs breathed out by the Spirit. Let us unite in the ordinance of God.